I want to thank you all for tuning in and for being part of this project. Uh, I am with the U.S. Forest Service State and Private Forestry. I'm the Northeast Area Regeneration Specialist. And I am based at um, Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. And when my predecessor, Ron Overton, left his position, one of he left a white paper and some recommendations for things we needed to do next. And the big one was um, setting up seed zones for the eastern U.S. So, there is a great need for seed zones in the east that are, uh, can be used by nursery sectors, restoration folks, but we really need your input and feedback to make it work. So that's what this all came about. Um, so my goal here today is to review what we've learned and hopefully to inspire you to join the conversation either, in, either on the forum page, which we haven't gotten a lot of use out of, but perhaps we can converse between now and May at the summit and then at points beyond. So what I'm going to do with this webinar is first, I'm going to review what we know. I'm going to refer to some historical literature. I'm also going to refer to the webinar series, all of which are available online if you have missed some. And what I want to try to do is synthesize some ideas that were presented and identify kind of ideas for how we move forward with coming up with seed zones that are mutually agreeable and can be applied. But I want to start first just outlining the, what we are trying to do. We really, we, we know that seed collection zones and seed transfer zones are not exactly the same thing. And so I don't want, even though seed, seed zones are traditionally viewed as being surrogates for both collection and transfer, we, we recognize that as the climate changes or as needs change, we need, we need to look elsewhere for seed. So we really are focused on defining locality. Where is the seed coming from? And then implementing transfer tools, either existing ones or develop new ones, to facilitate the transfer to the best places so that um, for future reforestation or restoration purposes. So I'm putting up an older map from an older paper to make a point that this is not a new concept. And these are, this is a paper, Seed Collection Zones for Black Walnut, which is from 1987. The authors are Denneke, Funk, and Bay. And these are based on a whole bunch of data, including provenance and progeny tests, previous seed zones, climatic data, physiographic land divisions, natural and political boundaries. What's interesting about it, a couple of things I want to point out is one on the map on the right side, you can see all these little, all the numbered seed zones. And what you'll also notice, they're about 100 miles north to south and about 200 miles east to west. And that was by design because that's what the data suggested was the best seed zone size. But you'll also notice table one on the left, they actually also make um, transfer recommendations. So if you're planning in seed zone one, uh, that area, northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, they recommend using seed from one, two, or three. So it's kind of a, a, a way to, it's, it's kind of an old-fashioned way to come up with seed transfer recommendations. The problem with this paper is that I had a really hard time finding it. I had to dig into my files. It turned out I had a couple of copies, but it's not widely available. And to my knowledge, I'm here in Indiana and black walnut country, and I don't think anybody's using this. And so good work, but, um, you know, if we can't make this communicable and applicable, it's just not going to be worthwhile. So I think we need to be conscious about that as we move forward. So next, I want to just review the concepts of empirical versus provisional seed zones. And Brad St. Clair did a nice job distinguishing these in his webinar, so we'll just review. Um, empirical seed zones are seed zones like the black walnut ones that are based on a whole set of common garden data, so they've got a genetic component to them. And they're usually pretty specific for species. Provisional seed zones are the kind of default seed zone, what you have to lean on when you don't have common garden data for the species. So it becomes uh, your go-to seed zones in the absence of any other information. So I want to summarize what we've learned about these types of seed zones. We'll start with the empirical seed zones. Uh, and again, these are for trees or plants that have enough commercial value that they've been fairly well tested, at least in terms of common garden studies. So I'm going to refer back to Ron Schmidtland's webinar, which was the very first webinar in this webinar series, and it happened to be last March. 
Um, and Ron did, reported on empirical seed zones for southern pines. And so I've summarized a few of the findings. One is that seed sources from warmer climates tended to grow faster than sources from cooler climates. And Bill Parker noted this as well for the boreal conifers at our later webinar. He also noted that seed sources originating from a site more than five degrees Fahrenheit warmer of the planting site were subject to growth reductions because of insufficient cold tolerance. So in other words, if you move them too far, it's southern seed sources do tend to perform better, but if you move them too far, you risk maladaptation because they don't have enough cold tolerance. So the recommendation from this was that seed should be transferred from a location that's 5 to 10 degrees warmer from the planting site, which ends up being roughly 110 miles, a similar number to what the folks were using, recommending for black walnut. So seed collection zones for the southern pine should not exceed 110 miles latitudinally, and transfers from cool to warm climates should be avoided. So you want to be intentional on the transfer, just broadening um, seed zones to allow more movement can accomplish some things, but if you're, if you're focused on growth or production, it might not produce the desired results. So here is an image from a 2001 paper depicting one, you can see the range of longleaf pine in the gray. These light colored bars are indicating the temperature isotherms, so the hardiness zones, and then these dark bold faced lines, the hashed lines, dotted lines indicate the seed transfer guidelines. And in essence, you would stay within you wouldn't want to cross those, those lines. So messages to keep within the zones. He did also created maps for um, slash and loblolly pines as well. And now I want to go further north, like way north into Canada north. Um, Bill Parker had uh, described a, a lot of his career's work, really, and uh, in which he had set up several, co a bunch of common garden studies, a whole bunch of them in Ontario. And he used principal component analyses to identify the climate variables that correlated the strongest with the data. And so this is a complicated, very layered analysis because there was common garden data. There were multiple seed sources from multiple places and multiple gardens. They looked at a whole bunch of traits. They looked at a whole bunch of climate variables and used the power of the multivariate stats to narrow it down to the traits of importance and to the climate variables of importance. So very strong statistical, um, statistical work done here. And what he found, there were some inherent differences in the climate variables that were best at predicting growth for jack pine and black spruce. And that's not too surprising. Black spruce, if you're not familiar with it, can grow in uplands and lowlands. But jack pine is very typically associated with kind of hotter, drier landscapes. So there were some climate variables unique to the species. But there were also a lot of variables that were common to both of them. And these include low temperatures, like in January, growing degree days, maximum temperatures, and total precipitation. And he also reported that seed from the southern sources tended to grow faster than the northern sources, which is similar to what Ron Schmittling reported. And it turns out to be a fairly common trend across, of it, across, uh, across the nation. And I think that's a, t a common trend across tree improvement programs. But what's interesting is that while this data was used to develop focal point seed zones that I'll touch on later, the point is that minimum temperature and precipitation can f do form the basis of both empirical and are useful for provisional seed zones as well. Now, I want to refer, this is some work that was not part of our webinar, but lessons learned. This is Jack Pine in Minnesota. And what was interesting to me, this is a paper from 1980, Jeffers and Jensen, and similar to southern pines, local sources of jack pine within 100 miles south of the planting site are the best seed sources of jack pine. So even though jack pine is very different from the southern pines, the, the recommendation is similar. And so we start to see these common themes. 
Now, white spruce, I want to mention white spruce because it's, I think of white spruce as being sort of a bookend as far as transfer distances. And I don't have a reference for this, but recommended transfer distances for white spruce in Ontario that I had found when I presented this uh, previously were about 3 degrees latitude and about 10 degrees longitude. And that ends up being about 200 miles versus, and 200 miles north to south and a little over 500 miles east to west. And that's, so this map on the left, I depict what those distances are, and they're pretty high. And white spruce just happens to be one of those species. It's practically panmictic. Its genetic material is distributed all across the landscape, and it can tolerate pretty high transfer distances. But what does that mean, then, for us if we're setting up seed zones? Well, if we wanted to set up provisional seed zones, we could still use seed collection zones that were similar to jack we could use the same seed collection zones that we use for jack pine. The difference comes from how we deploy it. So with jack pine, you may be inclined to keep the seed local, but with white spruce, you can bulk it from a bunch of different places and transfer at greater distances. So even though they're different species, we can, we can come up with a common uh, protocol that it could be implemented by nurseries. To, to, to still do transfer that would not be adverse to the species. So next, I want to talk about provisional seed zones and, and how, we, how we can go ahead and set some for the east. So typically, provisional seed zones are based on low temperatures, you know, the hardiness zones and precipitation, based on a lot of evidence from over time, and some of which I just presented to you. This map is showing the hardiness zones for the southeast United States. And what you see with hardiness zone maps are these kind of long bands of minimum temperatures. And they're, they're, they're often used by gardener, for gardening and horticulture. You might even have a catalog in your mailbox right now prompting you to buy seedlings like that you might try to grow in your hardiness zone. And they often refer to the hardiness zone. And they're useful tools, but they don't they don't, they're not good for perennials because they don't capture the variability within the species. So there may be seed sources that grow well in one hardiness zone and the same species would grow in another. So the whole point is that we want to start with this as a map, but we need to create some boundaries in there that are more representative of actual transfer zones. So looking at some older provisional zones, this was a paper from Lindstrom, and I did spell that right, it's two M's, 1965 for the central states of the U.S. And this, web, this paper, I believe, is on the website, the Eastern Seed Zone website. And he developed climate-based zone, seed collection zones, again, for the central states. And these collection zones were based on a few factors, including the minimum temperatures, the July temperature, and the distribution of the precipitation. So you see these colors here. They correspond to the map on the next page that I'll show you. And they also present, so here is the map, here is those precipitation colors, and, and I think basically it goes from wetter to drier as you get from coast, more coastal to inland. The dark line here corresponds to the seed zone boundaries, and these are subzone boundaries. And just by looking at this map, I mean, I'm here up in central, north central Indiana, or kind of more northwest, but I've done this drive from Ohio across Indiana, Illinois, and it's pretty homogeneous. One might say boring. So, you know, this would be the seed zone for this 5B area, for example. But deciding, like, what works and what doesn't, a lot of it relies on local knowledge. So here is another paper from around that time period by Rudolph in 1957 for the Lake States. And this one is a little bit different from Lindstrom. These are, and if you can read, this proposed seed collection zones based on Basically, growing degree days above 50 degrees Fahrenheit and average January temperatures. And here it is snapped to county lines, which is convenient. And here on the left-hand side are seed zones from the Minnesota DNR that's available online. And what you can see is there are some similarities. And the reason is that when the DNR set up their seed zones, they referred to Paul Rudolph's work. So it's not a coincidence that these lines, in some cases, are very similar. In the DNR's case, they also they snapped them to their counties. And they also, um, let's see, well, and they had to you know, create their own administrative barriers. 
What's interesting about Paul Rudolph's seed zones, though, is that when he was creating them and deciding where to draw the lines, he based it on how well it correlated with common garden studies for red pine growth. And red pine, if you know much about it, has very low genetic diversity. So I was actually surprised that he was able to get these separations. The other thing that's worth noting is that in Paul Rudolph's design did not include a precipitation variable, probably because red pine, at least for the studies that he looked at, wasn't sensitive to the precipitation gradient. So he was able to create these without using a precipitation um, a precipitation variable. So it's kind of interesting that these two um, adjoining regions used different underlying factors for their seed zones. And here we are in New York State. On the left-hand side, you can see the seed zones. What you'll notice is the counties are the black lines underneath it, and it doesn't snap to the counties very, it doesn't snap at all. I don't know if this map, if these seed zones are actually used at all. I'd have to speak to contacts in New York. I haven't thought to ask them that. What you can also see on the right side is these are the dates of last spring frost. And you can see the tight correlation here out here in, in western New York. You can see they're, they're strongly correlated. So the seed zones in New York are based in part on the last spring frost and maybe other variables as well. So the point is, is that we may not use the same variables for every region. We have to find variables that work the best. So in the Forest Service, these are what we call Region 9, which is the same as the Northeast area. It's the same states. These were established in 1970. It was based on scientists' recommendations. It was based on the Rudolph and Lindstrom publications I just showed you as well. And it came about because foresters realized they had to limit the movement of tree seeds and they had to develop some guidelines. So what they did was they limited seed collections to the National Forest of Origin which is great, and it works fine. But here for in the Allegheny, for example, if you wanted to collect seed from central Pennsylvania and you work for the National Forest System, you are obligated to use source-identified seed. That's part of the reason they keep seed from within their national forest, because it's source-identified. But if you buy seed from the open market outside of the national forest, it doesn't have um, so it doesn't meet any standards of source identification. So that was one of the driving forces for the seed zone forum, was because the national forest system needs to be able to step off national forest land and be able to purchase seed or seedlings from, uh, from source identified areas. Okay, I'd like to go review Andy Bauer's webinar on provisional seed zones. And this, is a, this work is important because it's really the only national level scale of seed zones that we have in the US. And these provisional seed zones were developed with five degree temperature bands, climate data from the prison climate group, and minimum winter temperature. They also developed, they used an aridity index that was an annual heat to moisture index, and it created six classes across the US. And as an extra feature, they overlaid the OMRIC level through ecoregions. Those are the ecoregions developed by the EPA. And it was developed for plants, but as Andy pointed out, it, does, it can work for trees as well. And this is the map and the link. To, this is the, uh, these are the co-authors in the publication in 2014. And it was uh, published in ecological applications. So it's fairly easy to access online if you look for it. And this map is being used by some folks in some regions of the East, but not everybody. So, but it's a great starting point, and we can drill down and figure out if there are ways we can tweak it for our states. So we, we realize that one size will not fit all taxa, but really our goal as we make these tweaks is to develop a set of seed collection zones that will work for most plants. And we have to figure out how do we handle plants that are exceptions. So this is one of the conversations we hope to have at the summit. Laura Leides also did a great webinar and described she's been analyzing provenance trial data as from a seed transfer standpoint for the northern states. And she reported how the tree species varied in their sensitivity to different climate variables. And of course, with provenance trials, as you're moving the seed, you're simulating climate change, you're moving it a seed source to a cold place, or you're moving it to a warm place, for example. And what she observed is some of the species she studied were highly responsive to changes in climate, such as black cherry. 
and others were relatively insensitive, such as oak and birch. And so the implications are that we probably want to develop seed collection zones for the smallest common denominator, so those that would work for black cherry in this case, and again, have different transfer recommendations for those that are a little less sensitive and, and could be moved further. So being able to identify the research that we have in certain regions will help us to identify what that common denominator is. And Julie Ederson did a great job describing a common garden study in Minnesota, and she was looking at three different species, red oak, bur oak, and white pine, and she was studying transfer between two seed zones in Minnesota, and the Minnesota seed zones are, again, about 100 miles north to south, about 200 miles east to west. And she did observe some population, what we say, differentiation. So in other words, the oak seedlings that originated from the northern seed zone had some traits that were different from oaks that were in the, the adjacent but southern seed zone. And the traits that she focused on were things like specific leaf area. So the northern ones had thinner leaves. They had a shorter leaf retention, so they dropped their leaves earlier than the southern ones and they shut down earlier. These are adaptations to prepare for the cold climate, the cold climate. But it was interesting because she didn't notice as many differences for white pine. So the implication is that we know that, that some species are going to be different. These particular seed zones were good at discerning differences for oaks, but maybe not for pine. But that the seed zones were big enough to discern different ecotypic differences, which frankly I was surprised to see. Um, so Provisional seed zones. One of the challenges, one of the things I'm hoping we can discuss at the summit is do we use the same model for all of the different states? We have some flexibility in that we can put different factors into the provisional seed zone map for different parts of the country. And so we'll explore some of those differences or why we would do that. One of our early, our second webinar, uh, was by Aurelia Baca, and she is a climate scientist and talked about rates of climate change and that a couple things came up. One, it's not expected to be the same for all regions, so we expect higher variability in temperature for interior areas than for coastal. We also expect higher variability for northern and southern states. Winters are expected to disproportionately warm compared to summers, for example. And the implication for our work here that we might want to consider sizing zones differently. They could be based on different factors for north and south, coastal and interior areas. For areas where climate change is expected to be more pronounced, we might need to have smaller seed zones, for example. Another reason um, to think about adding different layers into different parts of the country is there's this topic of endemism that Joan Walker brought up, and I'll discuss Joan's webinar in a second. There's this paper from 2001 called the Phytogeography of Rare Plants Endemic to the Southern U.S. And basically they highlighted areas with, with a lot of endemism. And endemism means that there are, um, these are rare plants that occur only in one, basically in one area. And the reason this is important is of the 6,100 native taxa of the coastal plain, about 27% of them are actually endemic species to those areas. So this is an important consideration because there's some, in, in these places, there's a genetic structure in place, and we might need to add a layer in two seed zones for plants for those areas to, cons to make sure these are a consideration. So one of those considerations is, is adding an ecoregion layer. It may provide an extra layer for plants, perhaps, and maybe some trees that have some special structuring. And so typically, the eco, when I say an ecoregion-based model, I mean one that includes climate and uh, land attributes. And as a geneticist, I've often struggled with the idea of adding an ecoregion layer because typically I refer to ecoregions as, as guidelines for what species to plant where, not necessarily um, which seed source to plant. But in a, some of these places, there are areas where there's a lot of genetic structuring going on that we may need to pay attention to. 
So Joan Walker discussed our, our, an herbaceous common garden study. So Joan is working with longleaf pine restoration, and she's studying the grasses that are, that are part of the restoration process. And so she discussed lessons she learned from it and talked about endemism as well. And endemism is mainly a consideration for the south, not necessarily for the north. But that there was a warning that ecoregions, as we, as we, if we just throw in an ecoregion, it may not necessarily represent those areas with high endemism. And so as we're moving forward, we want to, a couple of things that I got out of it, we need more common garden studies so that we can refine seed transfer for some of these very structured plants. But we also want to distinguish uh, these areas that have high endemism. And, and here is sort of a word of caution. These are, this is a map of the southeast of the EPA level three ecoregions, and I highlighted South Carolina. And what they found um, based on, I believe, some common garden work is that ecoregions and endemism, they actually had to put a line here in South Carolina to better represent um, seed collection zones and transfer for these endemic areas. So just because you add the ecoregion doesn't mean it's doing what you need to. So this, this is a poster from 2010 and developing provisional plant transfer zones for the southeast. And it, they added what they did, they modified the, the level three ecoregions to represent these phytogeographic patterns. So back to the provisional seed zone map, um, we want to just start use, I'm recommending that we use this as a starting point and we figure out if there are, error, if there are ways that this should be tweaked or adjusted for us. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. PSEs, provisional seed zones for, and for the Minnesota DNR, for example. So here's the DNR seed zone map on the right. If you go, if you zoom up into the provisional seed zones, this is what Minnesota looks like. And what you see is there's not a lot of agreement here. And so rather than tell the DNR you have to change the, your seed zones, I would say let's work with the seed zones that they've been using successfully operationally and see if we can find a seed zone model that matches it. And it, it so it's an iterative process, kind of a back and forth to find something that we can use operationally but actually has some biological meaning. And so, you know, how do we do this? So here's an idea. I called our GIS person in Newtown Square and said, can you just make me a map that shows the hardiness zones and layer it with, with mean annual precip? So these gray lines here are the hardiness zones, the ones that kind of run east-west, and the colors are the mean annual precipitation. And I looked at that and I thought, this is a little closer to the DNR. We, it, it, it may be, you know, this one, you could put a line there that could be, that could be a seed zone boundary. But this, this is why it's a process that needs some feedback and, and local knowledge. So we want to look at other models for some areas in case the, the, what's provided in the provisional seed zone map isn't quite working. There's another framework, too, to consider. Greg Nowacki talked about this, and so did Kevin Potter, the National Hierarchical Framework. So this is kind of like the, this is what the EPA did for ecoregions. This is the version that the Forest Service produced. Um, they're not exactly the same. They're a little bit different. So, uh, and, and Greg Nowacki talked about it. So actually, this slide comes from Greg's presentation. The colors are showing the precipitation minus evapotranspiration during the growing season. And it's showing the EcoMap domain. And it goes, this map goes down to the division level. And so if you kind of zoom in, you can see there, there might be too many lines, but maybe for the botanists, and I have to talk to the botanists, some of this, these lines represent, uh, well represent what's happening on the landscape. So perhaps instead of using the, the OMRIC-3, maybe we could adopt one of the levels of the National Hierarchical Framework. So Kevin Potter uh, talked to us, and he, he also discussed using this hierarchical framework. And, um, but he also added another layer into that, which I thought was really interesting. He looked at FIA plots and overlaid them with, I believe it was the provinces within those um, ecoregions. And it was actually able to identify species that were highly considered to be highly vulnerable because they didn't have regeneration that met a certain benchmark. So, and he found these 35 tree species included both northern and southern species. 
So the implications for us is that, well, one, we could use ecoregion provinces potentially. And secondly, we could target seed collection in seed zones where FIA plots reported fairly poor regeneration. And so there's a kind of an outlet for using this information that I hadn't thought of before. So a lot of folks are considering how climate change in our seed transfer decisions and how do we ensure that we've got the right seed on the right site at the right time. And there are several tools, and I'll review some of them. I want to first mention the seedlot selection tool. Brad St. Clair talked at length about this. And this is a tool that's used actively out west. I believe it's being, ad uh, being adopted for the east. If it hasn't been done already, it may be done for the south. But it's very interactive. You select your objective, whether it's finding seedlots or planting sites, your location. You can select your climate scenario, your transfer method, and your climate variable. And the tool will either tell you where to plant the seed or where to acquire seed for a specific location given the parameters. So it's a very cool interactive tool. Oh, and one other thing. Um, we could also, if we get seed zones that we agree on, we could, it could potentially be added as a layer into this uh, system. And Bill Parker talked about focal point seed zones, which is where you, you know, which is similar in terms of they, they have a tool that they can predict where you should be collecting seed for a particular site in the future. So it's also a landscape level tool. It's also got a GIS, strong GIS component. And it's, it's used to identify the best areas for seed collection and transfer based on the climate scenario. And so if I think focal point might be part of seed lot selection tool. I'm not 100% sure on that. But this is an approach that we can look at and a potential tool for commercial species for which we have common garden studies. So seed zones will be useful for making um, seed transfer decisions. There are other layers that could be put into it. Prasad discussed the importance of evolutionary lineages into a decision-making framework, and that may be on a species-by-species -species basis. And Greg Nowacki talked about using ecoregions. And you could guide movement from like different geographic areas. So if you were moving a seed source northward, you might want to put it on the same um, ecoregion or, or some distinction of the land. So there are other tools that, are, that we could consider adding as layers into either a selection tool or, or some other new model. But I want to make sure that we kind of keep our eyes on the ball here and not get uh, lost in some of the details. We're, we're trying to do the end goal or to have healthy forests for the future so that, again, the right seed, the right place at the right time. So I mentioned a lot of areas of discussion. And so to allow a place for us to talk and not just have you know somebody talking to you over a webinar, we developed a program for a seed zone summit. And it is now on the easternseedzones.com website. Since I want to offer the possibility of having different layers for different regions, um, we created these eight team areas. And we didn't call them regions because in the Forest Service, regions eight and nine are you know, easy to confuse. So we call these areas. And there are eight groups. And, and so the goal of the summit is we have several goals. One is to develop unified terminology to describe plant origin. We want to figure out what layers need are needed for each of these eight areas. We would be nice if we could discuss protocols for labeling and distributing seed, because really this comes down to the nurseries and the seed companies and, and seed collectors to participate. And also, as we look at you know, taxa, there are some taxa that might be difficult, maybe it should be exempt. We want to have these discussions as well. So this is the program that we've got developed in Lexington. Um, we're going to have some panel speakers and a lot of group discussion. So source identification, how do we measure it? What makes an effective seed zone? I referred to like you know, the DNR in Minnesota and trying to figure out, you know, is a new seed zone system better? How do we make those decisions? You know, what factors affect seed zone? What belongs into the models for each of these eight areas? And how about different taxa? How do we handle different taxa? And what are the challenging, what's challenging for applying them? How do we implement these effects? How do we implement these? And what are next steps? 
And lastly, you know, we can do all this great work, but if we don't get it out there, it's worthless. So how do we make this available for the masses? And I would offer having free, line, free online access for seed collectors, for nurseries, or anybody either at Ringer, at the Ringer website, or at the Eastern Seed Zone Forum website. And, and what would this look like? Well, I'm sort of number oriented, so I could imagine a table with all 2,377 counties in the Eastern U.S. And the seed zone for each county could be listed, and the ecoregion for each county could be listed, and then we could provide links to seed transfer tools. So that's sort of my, those are my ideas. But I would like to firstly thank um, the Eastern Seed Zone Forum organizing team, George, Vic, Barb, Joanne, Joan, uh, Paul, Sierra, Kerry, and Matt, and especially the Southern Regional Extension Forestry, Brent, and Bill Hubbard. And I also want to shout out to everybody who has done webinars for us. There were 11 or 12 of them. They were excellent, really important for the discussion. Um, and to the folks who have been paying attention and engaged, and I hope to see you in Lexington. Please be in touch if this is important or of interest to you, and I look forward to hearing from you. So that's all I have. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Pike? If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. If not, I am going to give you all the information for the upcoming summit. In fact, I'll just kind of start putting that up right now. So the upcoming summit is, as Carrie said, is going to be in Lexington, Kentucky at the Good Barn. It'll be on May 9th to 10th. And it's currently up at easternseedzones.com slash summit. Or if you're on the Forest Service virtual private network, you may actually want to use escf.sref.info slash summit. For some reason, the URL domain server that we registered with for easternseedzones.com is a little bit uncooperative with the Forest Service VPN. It has been working for me lately, though. Good, good. I don't know why. All right. So Stephen Handler asks, do you have any commitments from nurseries to participate in this effort? Um, I would say not directly, but I think I don't have any direct commitments, but I definitely have nurseries who are engaged, interested, and, and willing to participate. And we just, I think the issue is to create a product that they can implement. Um, snapping things to county lines is a start so that at least for seed collectors and people who have to combine seed from various collectors, they'll have the ability to just say, well, what county did it come from? And typically seed collectors, at least in the experience in Minnesota has been, seed collectors are usually willing to tell you what county the seed comes from, not necessarily anything more refined than that. So we have some folks who are engaged in it, and I think if we can show that this is doable, if we can create a platform they can use, I think we'll have a lot of engagement. All right, excellent. It looks like a few people are typing some questions into the box. And actually, it looks like Brad St. Clair is typing some questions. I wonder, I wonder if you would like to actually just speak. Perhaps I should give him that opportunity. Let's see what he says. I just gave him moderator privileges. So Tommy Rosenbluth asks, do you have any com commitments from public gardens to participate in this effort? 
So I, I have been working with a couple of gardens, and um, now that we've got the summit, I've actually got a couple who gardens who are interested maybe can't come, but I think we're going to use our networks and get this out as much as possible. Um, but yes, we have been thinking about them and trying to get them involved. All right. Let's see. So Brad, if you want to press talk, you can actually talk to us. I, I've given you the means. All right, so if, if you all want continuing education credits, I'm going to put a link back in the chat box. So you can click that link I just sent in the chat box if you're having issues getting the continuing education credits. But otherwise, when you leave the webinar, you should be redirected. And if you have any problems with that, just email me at bpeterson at sref.info. So Brad, I've got Brad, uh, oh, Brad, sorry. So let, me, let me read that out. Any reason not to simply use counties as seed collection zones, then determine how far you can deploy collections based on current and future climate. So yeah, the idea of using counties, I would say not as a zone, but as a, as a minimum administrative unit. Um, because the nurseries are going to need to, they're going to get, you know, when they acquire seed, whether it's public or private, they need to get, they're going to get it from a bunch of sources and they have to be able to push, put them together into common vials, literally into jars. So they need a tool to be able to, to do that. Um, but I would say, like, I would like that minimum administrative boundary to be at a county level and then we, boundary to be at a county level, then we can definitely take that and um, either group them into zones and then use transfer tools as they may apply. What's interesting, I call, I talked to Greg Nowacki about the idea of snapping eco-regions to county lines and GIS folks don't think about doing that very much. You know, it's supposed to be neutral to political boundaries. And so that's a little bit of an odd question to ask somebody, but it's definitely one if we can, if we can, have the eco regions, whatever level we use, snap to a county line. Uh, that's kind of a new request, but I think could be powerful. And if, if folks want to like work within a county, I'm not nobody would stop them. But for commercial seed collectors, dealers, nurseries, they need they need something that's a little bit uh, more clear defined, well defined. All right. It looks like nobody else is typing anything into the chat box. So I think we're done a little bit early today. Thank you, everybody, for attending the webinar. And thank you to Dr. Pike for delivering it. We look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in Lexington on May 9th and doing some seed zone work. And if you have any questions about the summit, you can go to the pages that I have listed here, or you can email me at bpeterson at sref.info, or you can email Dr. Pike. And your email is, Carrie? cpike at fs.fed.us. Excellent. All right. Do you have anything else to say before we head out? Um, I don't think so. Thanks all for paying attention and being part of this. And um, yeah, just please reach out. All right. And if, if any of you all have any folks that you think should attend the summit who haven't necessarily heard about this, you know, just maybe send them to the registration page. and. Even if they haven't been involved in the effort, they can watch all of the webinars that we've accumulated. 
Oh, yes, I guess the continuing ed education credit does require um, 49 minutes of participation. So in, the, in that case, um, I would recommend staying on here for about two more minutes. And then you should be able to get your credits. Yeah. And we won't tell anybody. Although, at the same time, I guess uh, Carrie could talk about something educational for the next two minutes. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what would you like to tell the, um, the fine folks who are listening and trying to get I, credits? I will say, if, um, we did on the website for the registration for the Seed Zone Summit, I did book a block of rooms at the Campbell House, which is an old historic house in Lexington, or a hotel. And there should be plenty of rooms for everybody, and we were able to get it at the government rate. They do have... Um, they do have a shuttle, so if you do not want to rent a car, you are they can get you can get picked up from the airport, and then we can get you to the Good Barn, which is about a mile away. I couldn't get anything right near the Good Barn that had a shuttle service. So please know if you want to attend. The registration is sixty dollars for the two days. It covers breakfasts and lunches, so it's not that expensive to come to, and. Um, if you don't need, if you don't want a rental car, you don't have to. You, we can, we can definitely shuttle you around. Um, and otherwise, the Campbell House looks like a nice place. There is a restaurant on the site, and Good Barn, I think, is right off the campus of UKY. And um, but we hope to get a group of. I don't know how many people are going to come. 30 to 50 would be great. If we got close to 100, we could do that too. And I'm still working on getting a facilitator. I'm waiting to see what's left in my budget for the year. And we should, we're hoping to have some facilitated discussions. So it should be a fun meeting, a lot of conversation. Uh, now that we've got every, all the details worked out, we're just going to shoot this around to everybody in our networks to make sure we get as big a group as possible of, of folks who are interested in this. So Richard also asks, is there similar work going on in other parts of the country? So not to my knowledge, out in the western U.S., they're um, mostly using, if my understanding is provisional seed zone work, there, where there is work going on on this topic is in Canada. And we're actually hoping to have a couple of folks from Ontario come and talk about it. They just, they've been going through some changes in their way they process seed and their seed zones are, are being discussed right now. And so hopefully one of those folks can come. But in the east, this, I mean, there are folks in Minnesota have been talking about seed zones, but, and I think everybody have been talking about it. This is the only real organized effort regionally to do this. And, and it's, it's easier for us, the federal folks, to do it because we can cross state boundaries easier than the state folks can, so that's why we're leading it. It just makes more sense. Okay, cool. Um, anything else to say, um, just in case people need a few extra minutes? I think, um, let's see. Um, it is the week or two after the Derby in Kentucky, which is important, so we shouldn't have tr too much trouble. We should not competing for rooms with anybody. Um, we really also, please spread the word to other societies and, and folks who do restoration work. This isn't just about trees. It is also about plants and restoration. And, um, and so we tried very hard to keep that on the radar because ultimately it would be nice to have a tool that could be used for all different purposes, at least have a common set of um, seed zones for everybody to use. I have a question. Yeah. Will there be mint juleps available still after the Kentucky Derby? I or think will they be all sold out? <laughs> I think you can get mint juleps anywhere in Kentucky anytime. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Yeah. So let's spread. We, we, we need to ensure that we get that word out as well. Yeah. Yeah. And there should be. Um, I haven't. Or so we didn't organize any field tours or anything like that mainly because of the need to keep this as minimum of, the, to keep this at a meeting level. We didn't want this to become a big fancy conference or it starts to hit um, different administrative 
barriers at the Forest Service be, or becomes, goes from becoming a meeting to a conference. So that's why we kept it fairly bare bones and simple to make it easy for people to come. And so we look forward to participation. Um, but feel free in the evening on the, you know, on either night to go out and um, at Lexington is a cool place. It should be fun. All right. I think everybody should be good now on the continuing education credits. And I think you are good to head out, Carrie. Excellent. Well, cool. All right. Okay. Thanks, um, Brent. Carrie and I are heading out. Everybody have a great day, and we hope to see you at the summit.